Afternoon all. I wanted this video to be a tiny introduction to a subject which I'm having some interesting thoughts on recently. Uh, I think these thoughts are emerging from some of my recent blunders in over the board chess. I'm playing for board one now for two different chess clubs against very, very strong opponents. And I seem to be failing tactically, you know, not to some grand strategy often, but often failing tactically in some cases. Um, tactics uh, are really of gigantic importance. The moment of opportunity to capitalize can make the difference even in a World Chess Championship match, as we've seen recently. In this position, Magnus Carlsen just played King D2. Our intuition for tactics is um, often increased, perhaps, if we think about uh, things like loose pieces, like here there's a loose piece on g4, trappable pieces, overloaded pieces, king safety. Is the king really that safe here? It seems there's only the rooks are in the corner, everything seems huddled in the corner here. We can get these intuitive intuitive perceptions though that, that can guide us. They're a bit like um, tips. If, you, if, you're running, uh, if you're trying to do tactical puzzles and you, you're almost on the verge of giving up, but there might be a tip option and you get some tip which changes your perception of the puzzle position and you're looking for exploiting a particular tactical vulnerability. And I've, ri I've written about tactics on the Barnet site. I, I mentioned there's a load of things you can look out for, but uh, Cecil Purdy was one to write uh, that after, after your like last move, make sure you're not leaving a loose piece, because if there's a loose piece or your opponent's leaving a loose piece, then immediately look for double attacks, pins, skewers are a type of pin, by the way, uh, and forks because they could drop off. Here there is, you know, this loose piece on g4. The king, is, it seems only exposable to a check. Uh, so when pieces are not protecting each other at all times, uh, there's this kind of uh, weakness of the pieces, I would like to call it. I think some people call it looseness of the pieces, but you could actually call it weaknesses of the pieces. And the, the reason I, I want to call it that is actually, I think I've mentally unifying two concepts which I haven't unified before. I've talked at length <clears throat> in different videos about the importance of um, you know, calculating forcing moves in particular and even outrageous forcing moves because sometimes intuitively you have no grasp of, of really what's overloaded until you look at the actual concrete variations, the concrete forcing moves. Um, so here you know you need to work through a lot of forcing moves. There's one you know forcing move here, rook d8 check but the king would just go back or, or come and safeguard the pawns, which is part of the plan. Vichy Anand here had this plan in mind of getting a pawn to a3. It would be a dangerous pawn on a3. And if white ever won a pawn over here, I think, and his king was over there, I think he was hoping to do something with his advanced a3 pawn. So that was his plan in mind. And sometimes our existing plan in mind overrides the absolute current state of affairs, which the last move has created all the weaknesses of the last move. Uh, there could be multiple weaknesses of the last move. It's not just the, the check, but there might be some other factors. So we start to look at forcing moves in the position. But um, the unification that I, I want to talk about is when, when we look at that, we're looking at really the essential calculations that we should be making when we look at forcing moves. But my observation is that perhaps it's a demonstration of the power of our pieces, the strength, in fact, of our pieces. Uh, when we look at forcing sequences, for example, th let's take a random move, knight f4. It, it's a forcing move, it attacks the rook, but it, it fails, uh, obviously. Uh, it fails. Rook takes g8 here, hitting the other rook, and we can't afford to do this. Bishop takes f4, it fails. But um, it shows that perhaps there is the power of this rook to take this rook, there's the power demonstrated slightly to take that rook, even if we look at that outrageous one. Knight h4, white could just take here, if nothing else. But we're kind of demonstrating the power of our pieces, the strength of our pieces. We can look at this forcing move, and it shows, yes, intuitively, we know there's a bishop on the diagonal, but the bishop takes g2 shows a bit the strength of that bishop can actually, if it wanted to, put a rook on g2 if that could be part of a wider drag and drop tactic that the rook's now on g2 and it's, it's actually a loose piece. 
Um, other moves, this is not so much staying at the immediate strength of the knight, knight, knight e7. It's not really taking anything or fretting anything, except for that rook again. Uh, pardon me. If, except for that rook on g4. So we have this, this strength of the rook on g8. Th this one looks as though it's harmless. I mean, if we look at this, this h8 rook, there's no amazing forcing moves that it's got available. It looks to be powerless. That it seems to have no strength. So the real, the strong, you know, pieces, the pieces that have strength, uh, most notably in this position, seem to be the bishop, the knight, and this rook. In fact, the king's not really able to threaten anything. There's no loose pieces around the king to try and gobble. Uh, so, yes, what I'm trying to get at is we can intuitively assess like looseness in in our pieces or the opponent's pieces. And white also has got forcing moves available. There seems to be a lot of power on g6 here. And on h6, these are both targeted, put under great scrutiny here, which causes black concern. Is white going to be taking on h6 soon? Is it always going to be safe to take on h6? Well, at the moment, any taking on h6 takes, bishop takes, this will be loose, this e5. So again, that shows the power of the knight. It can actually, it's hitting e5 all the time. But, um, I think what's interesting to consider is this matching process, this matching of the strength of your pieces and the kind of weaknesses of the opponent's pieces. I think it's that matching which might be a tiny moment in a game. Maybe when we're tired and we're not going to see this matching, even, you know, we, we need to, you know, have energy to look at at the even outrageous forcing moves and then we then we see the power of our pieces to their true potential they're not just uh, sitting visually but they have real implications you know the bishop has a real implication of a dragon drop the knight has a real implication of dismantling white center under the right conditions so we're trying to match in a way the strength of our pieces and we highlight the strength of our pieces through this you know looking at forcing moves and even outrageous ones we're really highlighting in concrete terms, the strength of our pieces, and we're trying to match it to the weakness weaknesses of the opponent's pieces. Now, this configuration change here, King D2, it seems as though it's absolutely minor and insignificant. It's a tiny configuration change. So, Black's got this kind of plan. He's kind of cached in memory. He's going to put a pawn on A3 to sort of counterbalance White winning winning a, a pawn over here, and perhaps get some play with his A3 pawn later. May, maybe through the d5 of the kings over there. So when king d2 was played, yeah, it's interesting, but we need to kind of reassess the power of the pieces. So how do we do that? If that's the first question, that's the kind of agenda, and not actually just to look at forcing moves. What is the power of our pieces here? Is, is the knight actually more powerful than it was when the king was on c1? Powerful in inverted commas. Is it stronger than it was with the king on d2. Is this rook looser or weaker than it was with the king on d2? Because actually we have two potential uh, weaknesses of the pieces here. The king's you know, arguably a bit more exposed on d2. But I really think it's hard just to use intuition in a lot of tactical positions uh, to, to make these comments. You know, you can make these two, two comments, but you're really not seeing the uh, you know the implications until you also match that with the power the strength of your pieces so it's not just an intuitive assessment of the opponent's you know weaknesses of the pieces it's the strength of your pieces and again if we do this evaluation here and we look at knight h4 we look at knight f4 we look at bishop g2 it doesn't do anything this rook's clearly not going to be doing anything exciting so but these two yeah if we look at knight takes e5 again has anything changed? Isn't the rook just protecting e5? Doesn't white just play rook takes g8? And you know we look we look at this again though rook takes g8, and then we notice perhaps there's a, there's a weakness of the last move here. It's not actually protecting c4. Again, there's a, we tap into the weakness of the last move, and it just happens to be in this position that the knight is actually stronger than it was in that previous configuration. There's the strength of the knight is actually uh, much better uh, than before because now actually with the king on d2 the knight can actually escape here this attack if only black could play this without rook takes e5 
and it, it was apparent it's possible knight takes c4 check knight takes c4 check a killer forcing move and so here on king d3 there's another killer forcing move so the knight's not left loose you know if rook takes then king takes c4 but there's actually knight b2 check here now you put this position to a computer and of course the computer instantly will recognize in this position knight takes e5 but as humans even humans over 2700 they're not instantly you know seeing the power of the pieces in relation to the weaknesses of the opponent's pieces now you might think this is a really weird video but i don't know i'm under the impression that the more you can have a stronger grasp on what it is you're doing when you're looking at forcing moves what is it you're actually doing you're emphasizing to yourself the strength of your pieces and what is it you're doing when you we identify loose pieces or trappable pieces what are you actually doing in both cases and can you unify those two approaches and it seems to me that you're you're really matching the strength of your pieces with the weaknesses of the opponent's pieces and this has to be done on a move to move basis the very current state of the position not your sort of stored plan from a previous move the very current configuration uh, may make you know a loose piece absolutely a losing loose piece you know once this this king moved here it actually made it potentially a losing position and this potentially decided the entire world chess championship this position of 2014 but i think yeah this is one of the moments that if we have a deep fundamental look at what makes you know tactics it's that moment in the game, that moment of opportunity that you can capitalize on. But I think a good grip of what, what you are actually doing with these processes is this kind of matching, I believe, of the strength of your pieces to the weaknesses of the opponent's pieces. I really think, I'm convinced that this is really what we're doing. Many people spend hours and hours tactical training, but I, I'm not sure people are, are really taking a, a philosophical look at what, what is happening here. Um, and these these are important clues, you know, a bit in in a game. You know, perhaps if there's a loose piece, you always look out for any small changes in position to see if you can like win the loose piece. And here, yes, the tiny change, King D2. You know, even a super grandmaster, Vichy Anand, he missed this opportunity. So what hope do we have of 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 seeing these opportunities in our own games? Probably not not much. But uh, my point is an intuitive grip on both these processes could really help us tactically, I believe. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.